What's going on, guys? Coach Matt and YouGoProBaseball.com here with my man, Isaac Hess. Uh, we're going to talk about in this video setting expectations. If you're a coach and you have a team or you're instructing players, these are some of the things that are not talked about so much. Isaac's got some really great information. In fact, that's what he does at Made Baseball uh, back home in California. Trains guys, players, young athletes, but he teaches a lot of these intricacies that we don't hear too often. Another thing that Isaac's got going on is cage list. And cage list is really cool. It's about backyard batting cages. It's basically the Airbnb of backyard batting cages. If you have a, tell us a little bit about cage list before we get into the video. For sure. So cage list is basically an opportunity for anybody that has a backyard batting cage to list it on our site and be able to rent it out to local players that play softball or baseball. And um, it just gives you an opportunity to make money, pay for all the travel expenses, all the club fees, all the things that you're doing uh, as a baseball or softball family um, throughout that journey of your player. And it gives all the players in your neighborhood that might not have an opportunity to have a nearby or convenient or affordable batting cage to use. Um, and they, they can start using yours. And it's easy as just accepting um, the approval or approving the booking on, on uh, online and then making it so that they can come right in your backyard and use it. and then you get money, it's easy. It's really cool stuff, check it out. I'll leave all the links down below where you can check it out. But like I said before, we're talking about setting expectations in this video. And what are you doing with some of your guys that made? Like, what are some of the main key points? I know there's a lot, we could sit here and talk for hours about it, but what are some of the key points that you feel are missed a lot in, in youth baseball? And some of the things that you're doing over there to really set the expectations and get these guys in line, ready to go. For sure. Um, well, first off, I created MADE Baseball. MADE stands for Motivation, Appreciation, Dedication Every Day. Um, we, we built it with the premise that the mental aspect is one of the things, is the most important aspect of being a youth baseball player. Um, really, as a person in general, anything that you're doing starts in the mind. It, it's very important to practice your, your mental fortitude and just create um, what I call fundamental thought processes. So. Oftentimes I have my parents that I work with, or their, their kids, they, they thank me and they say, Coach, thank you so much for uh, you know, teaching my son the life lessons, all the things that go into MAID. And um, I, I kind of think to myself, like, how, how, is this different? Like, why isn't every coach doing this? I feel like every coach should be doing this. And I think a lot of coaches do, do this. You know, I'm trying to create great ball players and great young men off the field as well. You hear that a lot, but I think a lot of the details that um, go into being a great person and a great ball player are often missed. For example, your uniform. Um, that's one of the ones I talk about often. A lot of times I'll teach kid, tuck in your shirt, you know? Duh. You should be knowing that you need to tuck in your shirt. So why, after a parent hears that, is a parent not being accountable or not making the kid accountable for tucking their shirt in? Um, you know, some people get it, some people don't. This should be something that should be an expectation set across the board. One is tucking in your shirt. Two, tying your shoes. Making sure that you're not the kid that, that comes to practice consistently with your shoes untied. I see it all the time. It's very annoying as a coach, especially after I've taught you a couple times to tie your shoes. Oftentimes I'll tell a kid to go and watch a YouTube video on how to tie your shoes or I'll tell the parent, take 20 minutes and teach your eight-year-old how to tie their shoes and make it so that they are now accountable for that because you only get you know, anywhere from 60 to 120 minutes for a baseball practice. If you're having to stop practice multiple times to have a kid tie his shoes, it's pretty frustrating as a coach. You're trying to move fast. You're trying to, to get a lot of packed into that practice. So, um, so yeah, those are two really important parts of it. Another thing uh, that you'll often see is you know, a kid with his, part of his skin showing right here. This is a small detail that should never happen as a baseball player. You know, you want to look sharp. You don't want to have your sock up or, and, you don't, or, and then have a little bit of skin showing and your pant right here. You want to make sure that your pants are covering your entire leg and that you're just not that kid out in left field that has some of your skin showing, you know? So you, as a parent or as a coach, you need to just make sure that these aren't things that you're allowing to have happen consistently. If a kid has his shirt untucked or is, if, if, if he has some skin showing, you need to pull him aside and say, hey, fix that. You know, don't let that go on for multiple innings. And 
the parents may not be doing it intentionally. You know, it may be uh, someone not from a baseball family who's getting their kid, young kid into playing baseball, and that's why it becomes a coach's job to communicate that and let them know, set the expectations as the title of the video about this stuff, you know? So it's, it's just an all around having a uniform team. What are some other things that you like to set the expectations on before, like in the beginning of the season? Right, so from the very beginning, the first parent meeting we have, you know, I used to run club teams. Um, so we would have parent meetings at the beginning of the season. That's when it's most important to set your expectations, just like a manager of a job or anything. You know, you got to make sure that people understand what you expect as, as the leader of an organization. So it makes it clear. It makes it easier for the, the parents to hold the kids accountable. It makes it easier for the, the coaches to hold the kids accountable. It makes, easier, it makes the whole organization run smoother and just be more on point with everything. So when we have the first parent meeting, I make sure that the kids understand that the attitude, their attitude that they bring to practice to the games every day, that is our number one asset. Our number, I explain what an asset is also. Even if the kid's nine years old, eight years old, I say an asset is something that is valuable, right? Something that you hold to, to that has value to you. So it doesn't matter if you hit the ball the farthest, if you run the fastest or throw up the hardest, if you have a bad attitude and you're not able to respond to adversity, respond to bad things, um, be a good teammate, do all the things that make you a quality overall player and person, then you're not going to be looked upon as, you know, as valuable to your team. Um, you're going to be able to make it up the ranks if you always have ex if you always have really great talent. But if you have really great talent and a really crappy attitude, then you're gonna have a really bad reputation. If you have a really great attitude and you're really just a grinder on your team that constantly does what is expected of you and, and constantly tries to overachieve and, and isn't having to be told things multiple times over and over again, it's gonna be a lot easier for the coach to slide you in the lineup. They're gonna be wanting to find a way to put you in the lineup because you're the type of guy that they want on your team, that they want on their team. So. Um, attitude is one of the one of the other major things that we talk about early and on. Attitude can not only be uh, an asset, but it can be a liability too. If you got a bad attitude and you're the cancer of the team, first of all, nobody wants that on their team, you know. And coaches aren't going to deal with it a lot of the times, you know. It could just be a, a big negative. So it could be a huge asset, or it could be a huge liability as well. Now, what is uh, is there anything that you're telling your players to? Uh, address you as or, or call you? Is there a way that you have them speak? Or is there any expectations you set in that regard? Absolutely. So there's a big difference between saying, yeah, uh-huh, and looking down, or yep, and the difference between that and, saying, and looking your coach in the eye and saying, do you understand? Yes, coach. I, you, anytime you're saying, yes, coach, sometimes kids will say, yes, sir. I say, you don't have to say, yes, sir. Um, but I'm, I'm not your boss, but I am your coach, and I want to make sure that you're paying attention to me. I want to make sure that when I'm saying something, it's not going in one ear and right out the other. Instead, it's going in one ear, you're hearing it, you're looking me in the eye, and you're saying, yes, coach, which consciously means that I'm paying attention to you, and I heard what you said. If I didn't understand it, I say, do you understand? If you don't understand, I tell all my kids, tell me no coach. And I say, if you don't understand, it's totally fine. If you say no coach, it shows a high level of maturity and it shows a willingness to want to learn. And it's a great uh, feedback for me that you're kind of with it mentally, that you're not just telling me that you understand everything. If you don't understand and you, and you don't understand, say no coach, I don't understand. And then I'm happy to explain it to you. If we're teaching seven and eight year olds that this is the expectation, that you know, if you don't understand, ask a question because we, we genuinely want to teach you. We want you to learn because baseball is a confusing and complex game sometimes. But when we set these expectations from a young age, a lot of these complexities, uh, you know, and things that might be confusing, they become a lot easier. They they take a lot of the nervousness away from a kid, I believe. And it sometimes takes a little bit of time, but if you do this consistently, and it's this, this is part of the fundamental of your organization then you're going to find that over time they're going to ex grow exponentially. So. so that's talking to the coach. Do you have any tips for them when it comes to like umpires or out on the field like that? Absolutely. Good question. So I also teach all my catchers. As soon as you got a catcher that gears up, I don't care if he's seven years old, it's his responsibility. He's, he's the general behind the plate. So there's an umpire right there. Oftentimes the umpires, a 17, 18 year old kid, sometimes 16 all the way up to potentially like a 50, 55 year old 
uh, you know, man. So it's his responsibility initially in the beginning of the game to turn around, say, how you doing, Mr. Umpire? My name's Johnny. My name's Isaac. What's your name, sir? And, this, you know, oftentimes, especially if it's a 50-year-old man, he's going to, whoa, this little seven-year-old's cool. I like this. You know, he's got confidence. Um, and then he tells him his name, and then he can address that umpire as Mr. Umpire, or after that, if the umpire's name is, is, is Steve, he can say, hey, Steve, was that, did you have that ball outside? You know, and just teaching the kid, if he calls a ball, did you have that ball outside? Because, you know, to me it seemed like a strike. You're teaching the kid to feel confident in his interaction with a grown-up, you know, and be able to take ownership of that behind the plate. When you have a kid like that, you're just teaching him the fundamentals of leadership. And these are not difficult things to do. They're just the expectations that you need to set. One thing I used to do as a coach when I coached teams was find out the umpire's names at the plate meeting. Of course, that's what you do. And then I would write them down on the lineup. So I would write plate, and I write the plate umpire's name, and I write in the field, and I write the infield uh, umpire's name. So this way, the kids can look and already know. So when they go out there, they can address him right away, which is even more impressive, I think, to the umpire sometimes. Like, how the heck does this kid know? You know, if the kid's paying attention. And a lot of times, if you get that close call and the guy likes you already, sometimes, you know, I mean, it doesn't hurt. Let's just say that. It doesn't exactly. hurt to have them on your side. Yeah, they're human. Umpires are humans. They have emotions going on. And anything that you can get, anything that you can have to have an advantage. I mean, you can look at it, you can look at it like that. You can look at it, this will give me an advantage if you want. Or you can just look at it like this is common courtesy. Like this is something we need to be teaching our kids. You know, we need to, we need to give them the confidence that it's okay to ask them what their name is. The same thing I say, you know, if it's a new guy on the team, or if you're out and uh, you know, you're, you're picking teams and you don't know this kid, you don't know his name, you don't just say, hey kid, that kid. I, I teach all my kids that you have to, that's not acceptable in our program. You ask the kid, hey, I forgot your name, bud, what's your name? Oh, your name's, your name's Joey? Hey Joey, we're picking you. you know? Instead of having the fundamental thought process think it's okay to say, hey kid, we, don't, we never do that. We always ask what their name is because that's just being a polite person in general anyways. So. I've got another question for you. Yeah. Who strikes out? Who strikes out? This is a, another aspect that we teach. We, we, we really go in depth over this um, in our initial parent meetings. So who strikes out? Well, in the MVP season of Mike Trout, he struck out uh, in 2019. If you go look up the statistics, he struck out just about once out of every five at-bats. And he's the best player in the whole planet. Cody Bellinger was, I think, once out of about every... 6.1 at bats or something. I looked it up and I did the math. So who strikes out? I believe the answer would be absolutely everybody on the planet. And how often do they strike out? Well, the best player in the whole world strikes out one out of every five times. Therefore, do we teach our kids that it's the end of the world to strike out? And do we feel bad when they strike out? When they strike out, of course, as parents, it doesn't feel good to watch our kids fail. But if we're if we're belly aching over a strikeout hardcore and we're thinking that it's okay for the kid to belly ache over the strikeout and feel devastated, then we're just not setting the expectation properly. If you strike out, you go to the dugout, you don't cry about it, you put your, your helmet back, you put your bat back. It doesn't mean that you're smiling with a big happy smile. You can be upset about it a little bit, but instead of getting crazy, instead of throwing anything, instead of saying it was somebody else's fault, what you do is you talk to your teammates and you give them feedback. Or you think to yourself initially, what do I need to do in order to not get beat by this guy next time? Is this something you can teach a seven-year-old? Absolutely. Is it something he's going to learn right away? Absolutely not. Probably not for the majority of kids, but this is a fundamental thought process and a seed that needs to be planted into a kid's mind and it needs to be drilled in over and over again until the point where he strikes out, he hustles back, he talks to his teammates, he said, hey, I felt like I got robbed on that call. The umpire called it this far outside of the plate. You guys better be ready to get up on the plate. Also, this guy's throwing pretty hard and he threw me a changeup. So be ready to go face that outside pitch and be ready to have an umpire that's gonna make a, a, a call and have a, a wide open zone on the outer half. So that's a problem solving mentality rather than a feel sorry for me because I struck out even though everybody strikes out. So this is just something you got to teach the kids and it's just missed by so many people. 
So baseball is a game of failure. You're gonna fail. The best hitters in the game fell in seven out of ten times. You yes, one hundred percent. So and to add on to that, you know, when you go from t-ball, and I really hope you parents that are still with us in this video so far are listening to this. When you go to t-ball and then you progress to coach pitch, and it's the five pitch rule, and they miss, they swing and miss five times. We don't want to give them a tee to hit off after that. And at least where I'm from in California, that's the, the precedent that we've been setting. If you swing and miss, it's okay, little Johnny. You swung and missed five times. Now we're going to put a tee out here for you. No, you struck out. You're, you're playing in coach pitch now. We're pitching you the ball. Tee ball is over. If you strike out, you're out. And it's not the end of the world because everybody strikes out got to learn it early. These things are great to set, set these expectations in the beginning of the season. The first year I ever coached a team, I was telling you before at breakfast, I didn't do this. I didn't have a team meeting in the beginning of the season. I just, you know, went and started coaching the team. And it was a terrible year, especially with the communication with the parents and the kids. And it, and it was just terrible. The next year I had a team meeting and laid out a lot of stuff on day one. And that season went so much smoother. And this is just a small part of a few things. There's many more things. We could talk for hours for about sure. setting expectations and baseball in general. And we are. We're going to shoot some more videos for you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned because we got a lot more videos coming. Don't forget to check out Made Baseball if you're in the L.A. area, Los Angeles, California. And uh, also Cageless. If you have a batting, if you own a batting cage in your backyard, um, if you're a guy that wants to get in a batting cage and you don't know where the nearest facility is or whatever, check out Cage List. I'll leave the link down below. Really cool stuff going on over there. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks, Isaac. Thank you.